All right, Hello Cave Church, how we doing? You guys good? And I'm ready. Hey, we're going to be teaching this morning, so let me remind you about your YouVersion app, because in a minute, I'm going to be rolling into some scripture. There is so much scripture in this message, I almost feel like i got to apologize for that. But if you go on your YouVersion app and open it up, down in the bottom right corner it says events, click on that, it'll pop up, this is a live event right now. And all of these scriptures I'm going to be rolling through, just talking about, they'll be right there. And you can take notes, and then if you save it, don't forget to save it, you'll have that as long as you have your phone, or maybe even longer than that. So it's a great way to take notes and to follow along. We've been in James, and today I want to talk about having a living faith. Those are James' words, having a real faith. And uh, I, I don't know where you grew up. I grew up in a situation, I love my hometown church. I don't want to throw any shade on them, they're great. But there was a time back in the 70s when I was growing up, I was a student, and they were a little uptight. You know, religion is when, like, you just start trying to do it on your own. You come up with these man-made rules, and we do things, rituals, we don't even know why we're doing them, right? Somebody else told us to do it, and you don't even know why. Maybe it's 100 years ago, 500, you know, you're just doing stuff. And they, were, they didn't like you to have long hair. Like, if you were a guy, you couldn't have hair that, like, was over your earlobe. That was a big no-no. And it got so crazy. I was like, at one point, I said, hey, Billy Graham and President Jimmy Carter have longer hair than I do. Can we just relax a little bit, you know? And, and uh, they, they had this thing where they, they hate, we had this new pastor that came out from California. When his wife came, the very first service, she wore a pantsuit instead of a dress They had a dying duck fit over that. I mean, just went ballistic. It was a big thing. And then they loved hymns. If you love hymns, I'm so sorry for you. I mean, no, I'm glad for you. We're all different. I got to tell you, I don't like hymns. No, I mean, okay, honestly, there's 10 or 15 that are good, maybe, maybe 20. But you can't sing the same 20 songs for the rest of your life. And so, and I know I'm not winning any friends right now. You almost love hymns, man. I mean... I, I don't like them, you know, and that's why we don't do them. Very first service, somebody came to me and said, it was pretty good, but if you do hymns, I said, not now, not ever. And so we just kind of stuck with that. But anyway, uh, they, you know, I would come to church after having been to something like Young Life. Anybody been to Young Life? Got to get a shout out for Young Life? It would be rocking and rolling. I mean, it would be so good. Or you would go out to something like our students are at right now. Do we have any students that are already back in the house? I know they're coming back. The buses are back. They're not here yet. They'll be at any time. And you would come back from something like that, and your service would be dead. You know what I mean? And so, really, we're trying to have like a student ministry thing here uh, for the adults, man. And keep it alive. Keep it real. And I want to talk to you about that because this is what James has been saying. If, if you've been in this series, he's been saying you've got to keep your religion real. Like, if, you, if it doesn't change what comes out of your mouth, then, he said, it might be worthless. He said, if it doesn't change the way you treat people, it might be dead. And this is one of the things about James, man. He doesn't pull any punches. He'll hit you right on the chin. And so he dials it in in even a more personal way in verse 14. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith, but they have no deeds. Can such faith save them? That's a huge question. He's asking all of us to consider, can your faith save you? Do you have any action, any life change, anything that goes along with it? Or is it just something playing out in your head, just something you're saying, but there's nothing that goes along with it? And here's an example. It says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, And if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and well-fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by actions, is dead. So the question he is asking, and he's dialing it in very specifically, very personally, wanting every one of us to consider it, do you have a living faith? Or is it a dead faith? Is it the kind of faith that will really save you? Or is it just something in your head, it's kind of halfway there, kind of halfway baked, but it hasn't really come out in the way you're living? Now, I I sort of don't mind causing you to doubt if you need to doubt. You know, I think one of the mistakes we make is somebody will have some doubts, we're like, oh, don't doubt, you're okay, you're okay. Well, maybe they're not okay. 
Or God will be doing something in someone's life, and we'll step in, thinking we know better, and we'll try to change the direction of it. You see, God tells us, he challenges us in 2 Corinthians, and in chapter, in chapter 13, in verse 5, he says, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself, or do you not know this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test? I don't think it's wrong. If you have doubts, be real about those doubts. And God can deal with that. Don't be ashamed if you have doubts. It's normal to doubt spiritual things because they're supernatural. After Jesus was resurrected, He came back and appeared to his disciples. They were all there but Thomas. And the disciples later caught up with Thomas. They told him what happened. And he said, I'm not going to believe it unless I see the scars in his hands and put my finger in the holes. And unless I, you know, where the soldiers put the spear in his side, unless I can put my hand inside the wound on his side. That's not only doubt, that's like rude. You know, that's like really aggressive. That's gross. And Jesus dealt kindly with Thomas. Now, that's some serious doubt. And every one of us has doubt. Now, we don't want to talk about it, but we'll think sometimes, is Jesus really God, or am I fooling myself about this whole thing? Are all of my proofs just my mind playing tricks on me? And one reason I think that we have doubts is because God created us to be curious and to question And to wonder about things. We test things we want to know. I believe God has even given us a scientific mind. That's why we have so many scientific advancements. And and science, they they question things. I have a science background. I have an environmental science major. And I can be very skeptical. And some of you are just skeptical by nature. And I think we need that because we live in a time where people... We, it's, they have, we're like, have all this voodoo in our culture. You know what I mean? Everybody's trying to sell us stuff, and a lot of it's really weird, and you have to push back on that. My wife was telling me that just this week, she was driving along, and she saw this, like, taco truck for dogs, and, and it was a taco truck, and they were selling CBD biscuits for dogs, you know, like marijuana biscuits, and I'm like, I didn't know that was a thing. So I was asking people this week, is that, what, do, what do you do with that? Is that like you park the taco truck and then everybody brings their dogs to the t- That's Yeah, that's what they do. Everybody bring and bring your dog for a CBD biscuit. And, and now, one of you may own that truck, okay? And I'm, I, I, I'm just saying, what I'm saying is I got a few questions, that's all. <laughs> and I think God created us to, to challenge things and think about that kind of thing. Even the disciples were skeptical. After Jesus' resurrection, they met together. He said, let's meet at the Sea of Galilee. And they met there, and then he said, let's meet up on the mountain. This is where he's going to depart for good. He's going to leave in his physical body. And when he got there, the Bible says, Matthew tells us, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I mean, here the disciples are with Jesus for the second time at least in his resurrected body. They're like toe-to-toe with him. He's cooked them breakfast. They ate fish and biscuits together. And still, some worshipped and some doubted. And when I hear that, that's good news. Because Jesus said about his disciples, they were slow to believe. That means if he was patient with them, he'll be patient with me. If there's hope for them, there's hope for you. And Jesus dealt with all kinds of levels of faith. One time, there was this guy that brought his son to the disciples to be healed, and they couldn't do it. So he came to Jesus, and he healed him immediately. And then when they left, the disciples came to him privately and said, what just happened there? And Jesus said, it's because of your little faith, because if you had faith, the size of a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Uh, What was Jesus saying? You know, we pastors, we like to make a lot about something, you know, like the mustard seed. I hear a a lot of pastors, I've talked about the mustard seed. We like to wax theological on it. Do you know what Jesus was saying? It's real small. That's all he was saying. He was saying, all you need is a little bit of faith. That's good news for us also. The disciples said one time to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. 
And he said again, mustard seed, all you need is a little bit. See, all you, need, you don't need enough faith to walk on water. You just need enough to walk across the office and share your faith with that coworker. You don't need enough to, to magnify bread and, and feed 5,000. You just need enough faith to cause you to want to care about someone who needs some food. Students, you just need enough to walk across to that student that needs prayer because you know what all is happening in their family life. And that's encouraging to me. And this is what James is saying. It's not how much faith you have. We always focus on that. He's saying, is it alive? Is it being exercised? Faith grows when you use it. Are you stretching it? Are you using your faith daily? And your faith is going to grow when it's accompanied by action. Look at verse 18. Some will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. James is saying it's not enough just to have this in your head. The demons believe, it, it, just say, hey, there's a level that you can believe, yeah, Jesus is God, he's the son of God. Maybe you've come to that level and you're like, I agree with that. But he's saying there's got to be something that goes along with it, some actions. Whenever you come to faith in Christ, God's going to change your heart, and he's going to be telling you there's some things you need to stop doing, and there's some things that you need to start doing. And then also, he's going to give you, you know, sort of like the can't help it. You can't help but share what God's doing in your life. Whenever Jesus did get up on the mountaintop with his disciples, he said, I'm leaving. I want you to go, and I want you to tell everybody. And that's for you and I also. He said, wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit, and when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you're going to have power to come, become my witnesses. And that's what happened in Acts in chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came on the church, and when the Holy Spirit showed up, it empowered everybody. Oh, you might be thinking about Peter. He preached this amazing message. 3,000 people came to faith in Christ. But everybody, all of the believers, moved outside onto the streets of Jerusalem, and they began to share that Jesus was alive and what he had done in their life. Whenever you're really saved, God's going to give you the can't help it. You can't help but change. You can't help but start doing some things, stop doing some other things. You want to tell people about it. When it, the same thing happened to me. I was living my life the way I wanted to live as a teenager, 16 years old, 15, 16, right there about my birthday. God was stalking me. This has been my prayer for our students this weekend, that God would stalk them like he stalked me. And when I finally gave in, and I finally, it was in a church service, I walked the aisle. It's got one of those old-fashioned things. We still do that because there's this public aspect you see in Scripture where God says, come out in front of me. Uh, right out in front. And so I, I met every step of it. When I gave my life to Christ, everything changed. I, I cut my hair. I had long hair, you know, which there's nothing wrong with, wrong with that ultimately. But for me, it was symbolic. I cut my hair because I wanted people, it was like really short cut. It was like there's a big shift, a big change. And I started telling all of my friends, I had a lot of friends, I started telling every one of them, God put it on my heart. I just went to everyone that I could think of, and I told them what Jesus Christ had done in my life. And they pushed back on that really hard. They thought maybe one of them said, he's, he's gone dark on us. He's going to be ratting us out. Nobody hang out with Mike Manning. All of my friends left me just almost by like a vote. But I, I kept sharing Christ. I had to go to my teachers that I had been a big jerk to. I was one of those kids. I would say some days, I'm going to make that teacher cry. And I would, but I'd also get sent to the principal's office. I had to go back to that same teacher and apologize and tell her what Jesus Christ had done in my life. I had to go to all those teachers. I went to my coaches. And you know, the senior high football coach is like a rock star in a small southern town. And he wasn't a believer. And I had God put it up to me, stand right there and tell him about what Jesus Christ had done in my life, a little 16-year-old. I went to the assistant principal who is in charge of, of discipline, right? And all he had ever known me as, the troublemaker. And I began to tell him about what Jesus Christ had done in my life. God put me up to that because there was this huge change, this huge shift in my life. And, and I'm, I'm talking about God still to this very day. You say, well, Mike, that's because you're a pastor and you're called to be nuts. But the rest of us, no. And I realize not everyone goes that crazy, 
when they follow Jesus, but your story should play out in real life and not just privately in your head. And so James gives us a great example, and I love how he sets up like a straw man. You've been seeing that, and he's more direct with that approach. Look at this. He says, you foolish man, this like straw man idea. Do you want evidence that your faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Now, here's where you're going to wish you had your version, because I want to tell you this story that happens out of Genesis 22. This is this amazing story where God comes along and he says to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to offer your son, your your only son, whom you love, and he's talking about a slit-your-throat, burnt-offering sacrifice. And and so I just got to tell you, this is, yeah, it's, it's crazy. As a matter of fact, let me tell you a story. When I was a freshman at the University of Arkansas, I'm freshman English, our English professor came to class one day with a Bible. He said, I'm going to read you something from the Bible. And my hopes rose. I thought, oh my gosh, she's going to take something from, I thought, Psalms, a beautiful Psalm. We've been doing poetry and that kind of thing. He's going to read a, a, a Psalm. But he read this story. And when he finished, he closed the Bible and he said, what kind of a God does that? What kind of a God puts a father through that kind of a thing? So unkind, so unloving. And so if you're feeling that, hang on, I get it. I understand. I'm just telling you, wait for it and give me a minute. Because what's going on here is whenever you come to faith in Christ, God's going to grow your faith and he's going to hit you right in the area of your selfishness. He's going to challenge your self-centered lifestyle. God's going to take what matters most to you and he's going to ask you in some way to sacrifice it. It's a test, and God will test us. He does it to build us up and to grow us. And so he says to Abraham, give me Isaac. You've been wanting this son for a long time. You've been praying for this. Whom you love. And so the question is, what is it that you love? I mean, we have some stuff we love, right? I mean, I love my stuff. I saved up for it. I picked it out. And I bought it, that's why I love it. You charged it, you know, you, and, and you love it, and it loves you back, doesn't it? I mean, it would if it could. We love our stuff. What is it that, that you have? What are you, your hobbies? What are your things? What's the big thing? Or maybe it's your personality. Maybe it's your life choices. Maybe it's just what you want to do with your life, or the way you are, or your, some habit, something you really love to do. Maybe it's something like gossip, what, whatever it is. God's going to say, I want you to sacrifice that. And we have to learn to hold loosely the things that we love. And so God says almost literally to Abraham, I want you to saddle up and bring it, bring him to me. And so early the next morning, Abraham saddles up his donkey. He brings with him two servants and his son Abraham, or Ab- Isaac, And then they go out and they cut some firewood and they put that on the donkey and he heads out on easily what must be the world's worst father and son road trip of all times. And Abraham left, I think it's important, early in the morning, the next morning, to to delay is to disobey. He left early in the morning, he didn't wait. Faith obeys. Whatever God is telling you that he wants you to sacrifice, don't wait. I would be like, God, let's talk about it. Let's, I, I need to check the theology of this and see what it is in the original language. Uh, no, but when God speaks to you and tells you something, he wants you to give up something, then faith gets up in the morning and it starts out and it obeys. This is why Abraham is called the father of faith. Why is this great example? He, he does what God asked him to do, and he does it immediately. So on the third day, they've been out there for three days. Abraham looks up, and he saw the place in the distance. Now, it's important to notice that, that God told Abraham, I want you to take your son to a place I will show you. He doesn't even know where it is. This is the second time. In Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham was living in Ur, in southern Iraq, little town, still there today. Isn't that interesting? Still a small town. 
He said, I want you to leave that area, and I want you to go to a place that I will show you is the promised land. He doesn't even know where it is. And so again, God's saying, I want you to take your son, and I want you to go to a place to offer him as a sacrifice. Abraham doesn't even know where he's going. It takes three days to get there. What a battle to keep going on, riding along, bonding with your son. Because don't you love a road trip? I mean, road trips are good. You really get to an, another level with people. Have you noticed that? You can ride along. Here's how you can tell that you're really bonding with someone, when you can be silent with them. So you're just driving along, and you don't have to talk, they don't have to talk, and it's not awkward. And then after those moments are when, I don't know if this is a guy thing or is this a girl thing too, but after you've rode along for a moment like that, then suddenly you kind of go to a deeper level, and, and you communicate. And that had to be happening on this trip. Abraham had to be thinking about, how much he loved his son, how long he'd prayed for him, his hopes for his future, the good times they'd had in the past. And, and he doesn't understand what God's doing and, and the fear and the dread is there also in those conversations. This is where your faith grows. See, it wasn't just what Abraham said, it was what he did. And, and he's going along and, and, the, and talking about the good times, but also in the background thinking about What's God doing? I don't understand. The, the promises of God were about Isaac. And wondering about this whole thing about human sacrifice, that doesn't sound like God. And he would have been thinking about how much he loves him and how long he had waited for him. And when they get to this place, Abraham says to his servants, I want you to stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We're going to worship them, and then we're going to worship together, and then we're coming back. Can I just tell you that Abraham worshiped in the middle of the trial, and this is when your faith grows. This is why I'm so adamant with you. I mean, last weekend at three out of four of the services, I kind of got up here and kind of spanked you all a little bit about worshiping, and I, I, I'm not apologizing, but what happened was I was standing in the back, and I saw so many people just kind of almost ignoring the worship, not even lip syncing. Some of you I know, you're all in, you've been here for a long time. And uh, you serve, and you weren't even singing. You're like drinking a cup of coffee, just kind of watching it. I think you'd have been smoking a cigarette if you know if you could just kind of, what's going on here? You know, and just like, no, no, you're, you're missing something so vital in our growth. God inhabits the praise of His people, and all through the Bible, we're told to worship Him, and we see people worship Him at the most difficult time in their life. So here, Abraham is he? He, he doesn't understand. He doesn't know what God's doing fully and completely, and he doesn't totally get it, but he worships him in the middle of this trial, at the end of this journey, and he told these two servants, hey, we're coming back. We're going to worship up there, and then we're coming back to you. And so God leads you on this journey, and you're making this sacrifice, and it brings you closer if you'll let it, whatever you're going through right now. Lean into your relationship. Worship God the whole time. You're, you're hearing God. You're praying about it. You don't understand it. You're getting ready to make the sacrifice. That whole process can draw you nearer to God. And this is the way your faith grows. We will worship and we will come back. He says Abraham was trusting that God was going to provide. He didn't have all the answers. He didn't understand even what he was doing. But he was saying, to them, it really reveals his faith. We're going up there, but I guarantee you, I don't know how it's going to happen. We're going to come back. And I have to believe that he was thinking about how God had worked in his life. You see, God had promised to give Abraham and his wife Sarah a son, not just a baby. He said to them, you're going to have a, a son. And when, when Sarah heard it, she laughed because she was 90 years old. I totally get it. You know, as the older you get, your filter kind of goes away, doesn't it? Some of you, I mean, by the time you're 90, it's gone, and that's funny, you know. I'm going to have a, <laughs> that's hilarious. Abraham was 100 years old. But God said, not just are you going to have a child, he said about this time next year, you're going to have a son, it's going to be a boy, and I want you to name him Isaac. And it's going to be through Isaac, this relationship that I have, God's saying, what I have with you, Abraham, I'm going to extend it through Isaac, I'm going to have a covenant with him, a promise and a contract with Isaac. And I had to believe that Abraham was thinking through this and thinking, if God can tell me I'm going to have a baby boy at 90 and 100, we're going to have a child, name him Isaac, and the contract is going to extend through him, 
I don't know how he's going to do it, but I believe we're coming back. And Hebrews even says, the Bible tells us that Abraham believed that God could raise Isaac from the dead. Hebrews 11 says, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. Now, when you hear this figuratively speaking, it reminds me that faith is following God when he asks you to do something, even though you don't know why. I mean, why would God ever put Abraham up to that? Like my English professor asked. Why? Because this story becomes the greatest foreshadowing of the cross in the entire Old Testament. You have Abraham with his son, whom you love, his only son, taking him to sacrifice him on Mount Moriah, is what we're told in the story, which is in Jerusalem, and many people believe, I believe too, that this is on the very same hill that we call Golgotha, and that he, he takes his son there by faith, and we're told that when they get there, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on Isaac, and then he carried the knife and the fire, and they went up that hill. And so Isaac is carrying the wood for his sacrifice like Jesus carried the cross up the same hill some 2,000 years later. And so we're told, especially in like the book of Romans and Hebrews, that it wasn't the law that saved you, but people come to faith in Christ through the faith that Abraham had. He's called the father of faith. So for the next 2,000 years after this, people are looking forward to the cross with the, the example of Abraham's faith, and that's how they come to faith in Christ. We're looking back at the cross 2,000 years later at what Jesus did on the cross and then back at what Abraham did. Now, if I told you all of that and I said to you, would you go through what Abraham went through if for 4,000 years people could be encouraged by your story, it makes much more sense. And my English professor would never know that unless he knew all this about Scripture. And faith is when we follow God when we don't know and we don't understand. Because God wants to do the same kind of thing in your life. In a different way, maybe in a smaller version than with Abraham. God wants to take your life and what he's doing, the sacrifices he's asking of you, and your spiritual journey... And he wants to combine that with a message of the cross and use it in people's lives. And my question is, will you let him do it? And, and James is saying that when we step into that journey, that's when you know your faith is real. When you come alongside, Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to go, but I'm going to leave you here. And I want you to go make disciples. And he said also, later, wherever I am, there my followers will be. So he's like, I'm still going to be doing this. I'm going to give you the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be out reaching people. I want you to meet me there. And a disciple will follow his master. And come alongside in that journey. And that's where you know that your faith is real. And so they go up there to offer this sacrifice. And when they get up there, Isaac says, Father, the wood and the fire are here. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And I love what Abraham says. I have this on the screen for you. I didn't want you to miss this. Look at this. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Many of you need to hear that for the journey that you're on right now, for the place where you are. And if you're following God and you're having to make a sacrifice, you're struggling and you don't understand, it doesn't all make sense, it doesn't fit the pattern, you need to personalize those four words. God himself will provide. Not religion, not, you know, what my parents believed, not even what my prayer group or whatever. No, God himself will provide. You see, God wants us to be on that same journey with Abraham. He wants us to be following him, making those sacrifices, climbing up this mountain, and trusting that God's going to provide. As a matter of fact, Later on, uh, in the next verse, Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And because there, he looked over and there was a ram, there was a sheep in the thicket. And God provided. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And this is one of the Hebrew names for God, Jehovah Jireh. It comes from this. God will provide. He is the great provider. 
whatever you need, whatever you're going through, whatever sacrifice he's asking of you, God himself will provide. And this is where your faith becomes personal. It's not about a religion. It's about a personal relationship with the living God who is provided to provide you with everything you need in every area of your life. God is saying, live on this mountain, this mountain of the Lord, this mountain of God's provision, this mountain of sacrifice and faith. Take those risks, and God is going to say, I'm going to provide. But you've got to step out. This journey is a risky journey. He's going to ask you to follow him. He's going to ask you to make some sacrifices. Romans 12 says that it is our spiritual worship to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So this whole journey is about God saying, I want you to sacrifice that. I want you to give that to me. I want you to change in that area. I want you to pour that bottle out. I want you to get out of that relationship. I want you to start getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning and having your quiet time. I want you to walk across the office and share your faith with that person. I want you to pray for that student. I want you to follow me. It is a life of sacrifice, but that's how you grow. God's going to say, I want you to go against popular culture. Don't go along with what everybody else is doing. I want you to be different. I want you to love more deeply. I want you to learn to go the second mile. And following God always means a risk. Hudson Taylor, who founded the China Inland Mission, he's one of the greatest missionaries of all times. And he said, unless there's an element of risk in our exploits for God, there's no need for faith. Risk and faith go hand in hand. So what is it that God's asking you to do in following him? What risk is he asking you to take? I've learned that the greatest risk produces the greatest favor. The greatest risk produces the greatest result. The greatest risk produces the greatest growth. I've thought back over the things that God's asked me to risk so many times, like being 16 years old and risking going to all those people so that you become really the village idiot at the end of all that. In many people's minds, you just lost your mind. And many of those people I shared faith in Christ with, they never came to faith in Christ. One that I I thought he was really into it. He said, yeah, we're going to come to that revival. And I was asking him and really talking to him about it. Later I found out he went to all of his friends and just, it was a big joke. He never came. And no one was ever going to come. They were just this big trick they were playing on me. But you know what? We're off to college. About four years later, he knocked on my parents' door. He didn't even know where I was at that point. And he said, I've lost track of Mike, but I want you, he told my mom, tell him I prayed and I came to faith in Christ. I was laughing at him, but I was listening. And all through the biggest risk, to leave Wyoming and cross the country in a school bus with all of our stuff to go to graduate school to become a pastor, where the greatest risk, it produced the greatest results. That was at 26. We had two kids, four and five years old. To start the Cove Church at 38 years old and start over all over again and leave your full-time job and basically sell everything and start all over again, the greatest risk results in the greatest result. And so what is it that God's saying? I want you to give it up. Maybe it's your reputation, your status, some embarrassment or some awkwardness or your time or your finances. This is what James says. Look, he says, you see that faith and his actions, Abraham's, were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Now, it's your faith and your faith only that saves you. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says that you're saved by faith. It is a gift of God. It's not by works, so you can't boast. There's nothing you could do to save yourself. But James comes alongside of that. He comes almost up to the edge of it by saying, that your works, your life, your change, it coming together with your faith, it makes it complete so that you know. Whenever Abraham was about to sacrifice, he had that knife there, and the angel said, Abraham, no, stop, don't do it. Now I know that you love God. You see, God already knew, but, but now Abraham knows, and now for 4,000 years, everyone knows. And we all need that similar experience so that we know, so the angels in heaven know, so that your friends know that your faith is real. Now, what I want to do right now 
So I want to get you guys on your feet. Would you guys go ahead and stand up? I want to pray for you. And I want to shift gears, if I can, for just a moment. I also want to relax, put you guys at ease. Um, we've only been going for 57 minutes. Can you believe that? You get your money's worth at the Cove Church. Can I just say, for 57 minutes? Come on. Yeah. And uh, we really, we really uh, promised this service to be an hour and 15, so, okay? So we have 18 minutes. Just trying to get you to chill. You know, we just kind of get up. And I get preaching fast, and I get going and all, and I, and, uh, I just want to slow this thing down. Because I believe that it's the Spirit of God with the Word of God that changes us. And so I want to challenge you right now. I want us to be praying through what we've been talking about. And some of you, you have some doubts about your salvation. And here's what I've been telling people for like 40 years, since I was like 16. What I did is I started praying after I had that experience. I wanted to know the next thing would be get baptized if you're a brand new Christian. So, but I got saved, I thought, at nine. I was so confused. I would get up every night after everybody was in bed and all the lights were out, and I would get on my knees on the hardwood floor, and I prayed for two weeks, off and on, sometimes for two or three hours. I was developing this relationship with God. It was like he was right there in the room. And I was asking him, Lord, when did I get saved? Was it at just two weeks ago, you know, at 15? Or was it back when I was nine years old? That's why when I'm telling my story, sometimes you might be, when did he get saved? And God revealed, he said, no, you got saved at nine. I remember the wording, you know, as a whole experience, kind of brought that back. And I remember, oh, yeah. But I didn't really grow any in that. So here's what I've been telling people for 40 years. If you have doubts, let's pray right now. Ask Christ to come into your life so you don't have to leave here with any doubts. And then go on that journey that I went on and pray and say, God, did I get saved now? Or, or maybe you, sometimes it was a child. You don't even know. You shouldn't go life through life thinking, I don't even know my story. You know what I'm saying? I didn't even know when I got saved. I'm confused. I don't know. Don't stay there. Figure it out. But in a moment, I'm going to pray with you so you can ask Christ to save you. So you'll, you'll leave here, you'll know that today I know I'm, I'm good. But then go figure it out. And then I want to pray for those of you that you feel like your faith is real, but it's on life support. It hasn't been a very living, very active faith. And I'm going to lead you in an opportunity to pray and say, God, I want to have a living faith. I want it to be real. The trend is like gravity is just to go down to cold, dead ritual. And James says, watch out for that. Don't let that happen to you. Have a living faith. Have a real faith. And it'll give you the can't help it. You can't help but change. You have to because God just, he's on you. He just like stalks you. And you can't help but share it. You couldn't hide it from your spouse. You couldn't hide it from the coworkers around you because they'll be like, something's happened. What changed? You're different. What's going on? Tell me about it. That's a living faith. And God will give you the power through the Holy Spirit to share it then. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, I want to lift up the person who, you have doubt right now, you're not really sure about your salvation. And I know, Lord, you don't want us to live there. If that's you, then I would just ask you to pray along the lines of what I'm praying and just say, God, forgive me for my sin and own that completely. I think we're afraid of that today, but, but just say, God, I know I'm, I'm a loser when it comes to relationships and, and with you. I've sinned intentionally and unintentionally. I've hurt people. I've made mistakes. I just, I'm selfish. I do what I want. And, and Lord, I'm, I need you. God, you're perfect. I could never come into your presence like I am. And I, you know what? If you're not at that place, maybe you're just not ready yet. Because I think you get saved when you just come to that point where you're so sick of your own sin that you want it gone. And you realize, God, you're the only one that can do that. You're the only one can take it. Lord, take my sin. You died on the cross. I believe that totally. You're the son of God, Lord Jesus. And I want you to take my sin. And I'm going to follow you completely and totally with my life. I don't care what anybody thinks, what anybody says. I, and Lord, I am completely with complete abandonment. I'm going to follow you and live for you all the days of my life. Now, in 
I think, can we just right in the middle of this prayer just celebrate those who are praying that prayer right now? Lord, for the rest of us, Lord, we want to have a living faith. And some of us have been around long enough to see this kind of ebb and flow in our lives. You have to battle back against it or we just end up in cold, dead religion, just church and it's a constant challenge. We need to be challenged with James's message, not just as a church, but individually. I believe the Lord is calling us right now to live on that mountain of his provision and to go on that journey of faith that Abraham is like, Isaiah 51, 1 and 2 says to look to Abraham, the rock from which you've hewn and the quarry from which you were taken. It's the example of this living faith Abraham walked in faith, and there's a risk to that. Would you acknowledge right now before God, God, I want to follow that. I'm going to follow the risk. This is where the reward is. This is where the results are. What is God asking you to sacrifice? Will you do it right now? Will you give it up for him? And will you, will you say, Lord, I'm going to do what you're asking me to do? Maybe it's to stay faithful because you're about to give up. Everything is going well. You've got, uh, you know, you have more money than you can manage, and you've got some things that are happening, but, but there's something else that's tempting you, and, and for you, it's to stay on that path that God's put you on and keep doing the right thing. Now, you're going to give up all these other temptations and things around you. Maybe you're right about to give up on your marriage. So there's some alternatives that you need to sacrifice and kill. Whatever it is, God's going to lead us on that path. This is the way he grows our faith. You know, sometimes we feel so guilty about ha having enough faith, but it just starts by having a living, active faith. So, Lord, you show me, and I want to grow and follow you. Thank you, Father, for your word and for the life change that's happening right now through the Spirit of God. Thank you for those who've come to faith in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.